because I was part of a Native American subculture in prison. And we have a lot of rules in California about these subcultures, right? Very racist. You don't cross certain lines. You don't do, you don't mix, right? You're talking general population yards. Rules that I can tell you right now, I didn't agree with then. I don't agree with now. But I wasn't in a position to say I don't agree with. Yeah. I had to go with the flow. You know what I mean? I'm not going to risk my life over some empathetic act in there. You know, I risk my life now for an empathetic act. I care about people. Real quick before the video plays, this is really important. I know everybody wants you to subscribe to their channel too. I can't lie, so do I. You can take your finger and just click that subscribe button. It's free, no spam emails. It helps me out a lot. It lets me know you appreciate what I'm doing. Thanks. Most of what I do is I'm just trying to showcase formerly incarcerated folks who are successful, mostly with regard to higher education, but not all the time. You know, I've, I've talked to some guys who are successful business owners yeah. or just successful in the community uh, or as family men, you know, as not necessarily making a lot of money or higher education, but they're yeah. just successful. They're not back in prison. They're doing really good. They're productive citizens. Um, so I just want to showcase that to, you know, break down the stereotype of people who are in prison, what kinds of people are in prison and, you know, what they're like when they get out. Yeah. So you have um, an interesting story. I've, I think I heard you for the first time like four years ago at one of these. For me, I had never known anyone who had been to prison and was pursuing higher education until I came to one of these. It just like opened a whole new world of other people doing the same, you know, on the same journey. So I think I heard you like four years ago at a talk. Um, it, it was probably in Arlington. So this would have been like 2017. So um, so you've been on my radar ever since, especially lately. You've been doing the powerlifting stuff. Yeah. And um, that's uh, always been a part of what I do. Not powerlifting in particular, but uh, definitely fitness and lifting weights. Yeah. So if you could uh, just describe a little bit about what your life was like, which eventually led up to an incarceration experience. Yeah, for sure. First of all, thank you for for for, for having me. Um, and a cool little, cool little semi introduction there. I appreciate that, that uh, you know, we, we do this work together, right? And uh, just try to inspire folks. But for me, I mean, honestly, like life um, is a friend and mentor of mine, uh, Dr. Charles Terry, uh, called Chuck, Chuck Terry. I don't know if you ever, if you know his work. He's uh, one of the founding fathers of convict criminology, he wrote this book called The Fellas. And in this book, he talks about um, three types of people. He talks about um, drifters, wannabes, or regulars. And drifters are people who see a certain lifestyle, just kind of get involved with the, somebody they know, and they kind of just drift into this lifestyle. His, in particular, was talking about heroin use, but it can be applied to like gangs, it could be applied to any negative lifestyle. So people just kind of drift into this life. Uh, another one is a wannabe. He talks about wannabes being these people who see a certain lifestyle and they find it attractive or they find it like something they want to do. And eventually they get so entrenched in the lifestyle that they can't get out. And the third and last population he talks about are regulars. Right, regulars are just people who were born in it. Family member, father, mom, uncle, somebody who is just a regular gang member, addict, alcoholic, kind of like the, the individual, the child, pretty much has no option. Mm -hmm. It's what we see, it's what we do. We wake up, we see it, we live it in the neighborhood, we go to school, we get targeted. And for my life, I'm a regular. You know, I saw at a very young age, um, you know, my earliest memories of, of, of stuff, four or five years old, watching family members and community members, men that I looked up to, drugs, selling, gang membership, you know, the hustle of the street. And uh, for me, it was kind of like a natural um, trajectory that that was going to be my life too. Yeah. Right? Especially the first time I ever got busted. First time I ever got busted was 14 years old. Juvenile detention, uh, 14, 15, 16, 17. Uh, you know, going to court and hearing even judges say, you know, you don't, you don't 
if you don't if you don't get your life together, there are those sixteen years old. You know, judge, you don't get your life together. You're gonna be just like your uncle. Well, you he knew he knew he knew my uncle. Yeah. Right. And so instead of like intervening in my life and saying I don't want you to be like your uncle, he said he just kind of like pushed me through the system. So my life is just I'm a regular dude. I'm a regular uh, in the neighborhood. Um, first time I ever went to juvenile hall, I got the clout. I felt it. I felt good about like, oh, people are seeing me, right? Yeah. Jails, um, county jails, um, three different county jails within my community, within three different counties, um, within my area. And, uh, you know, I was in and out of those places and, um, I was just a regular dude. And then prison, uh, drug use, um, in and around gangs, the violence that comes with that. Um, my life prior to my last prison term was just a regular person. You know, that's all I knew. At one point in my life, I thought that's going to be my life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and you know, not just that, not only did I think, think, think that, but my family, my family too, my mom, my sisters, um, my daughter, I had two daughters at the time of my last prison term. I still have two daughters, by the way. Um, and, you know, I, I knew one of them fairly well. The other one, I didn't know at all, right? And so um, I think for me, it was just, you know, that lifestyle was just normal to me. I didn't know anything out of it, outside yeah. of it. And so um, I talk about that because I think it's important that there are, there are groups of us who, um, yeah, we don't know anything outside of it. You know what I mean? And um, that being part of my identity, right? That being part of, you know, I'm I'm an older cat and I still dress like the people in my community. I still talk like the people in my community because I am the people from my community. You know what I mean? I am, and I respect that very much. I just don't act or engage in the social world like that anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um and so, you know, you know, being a changed individual, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But I think for me growing up, and I think, I think prison was just a natural, it's just a, a natural trajectory, natural, it's normal. Yeah. You know what I mean? On that threefold scale, I've heard of convict criminology, um, not Mr. Terry in particular. On that threefold scale, I probably fit into the wannabe version. Uh, but I did um, know quite a bit of what, would be called regulars. Mm -hmm. And as a being generally skeptical most of the time, it was hard for me to understand because even though I didn't have a lot of family going to prison, it was impoverished and you know, yeah. the, the way that we grew up um, was surrounded by that lifestyle. But in my actual family, we didn't have a lot of people going in and out of prison or on drugs. It was hard for me to see how somebody could say that could say I didn't have any other options until I was more involved in the streets. And I did have friends whose dad was down with the gang and their grandparents were yeah. down with the gang yeah. and their grandparents would be out on the streets with us. And it was just so odd. And those would be your regulars, I, yeah. I, I, I would suppose. And so some of the guys that I've talked to here lately, that was, it was the same thing. Um, and they've also used terms like it being a rite of passage, yeah. that prison was not like it was scary and traumatic, but it wasn't abnormal right. because it was sort of given like, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. um, this is just what happens. Um, yeah. It's really, really unfortunate. And on that, you know, in, in, I wrote an article in 2010 um, called From Corrections to College. And um, when I wrote this article, I really focused on my, one of my very first teachers, right, my uncle. And in the article, I wrote like seeing him shoot up heroin. And him saying, like, you know, telling me, like, I remember him clearly saying, you know, um, don't let the drug do you, you do the drug. Basically, mm -hmm. don't let it, don't let it, you you can maintain your power, you maintain your power over it, right? And um, for him and my, my cousins who were older, my other uncle, it wasn't a matter of... Um, if I get to pr prison, it's a matter of when I get to prison. So I learned about prison politics and, you know, the unwritten rules and the codes even before I ever got there. So when I got there, yes, it was scary. And I can admit to you now, I was terrified, but I didn't know how to express being scared. I didn't know how to say like, 
I'm scared. I'm nervous. I'm anxious, right? Those emotions, the, the, the way they played out was like this, yeah. you know what I mean? And so I'm scared and I'm going to fight for my life versus me now. If I feel an emotion, I'm going to tell you like, man, I'm feeling a certain way I'd like to talk about. It. Right. And that's unheard of for my life or, or unheard of for the life of so many people. Yeah. And that's what education has given me. We'll get, we'll get to that in a few, but I think that, I think for me, and it wasn't just me, it was, it was other, it was my homeboys, my age, who we all kind of in our neighborhood, the kids growing up in the neighborhood, most, most of us went to prison. And you got those people that, who knew us and we were around us and never went, they had good jobs, good families, good, they, you know, whether it was good mentorship or they had a, an active father in the house. I don't know what it was, but for the select few in our neighborhood, most of us went to prison. You know, yeah. most of us have records and, um, you know, of them, not too many are actually, uh, of all them growing up, the people I grew up with, not, not one is in education. Some of them are doing well, they're sober, they have little businesses or they figured it out without education. But yeah, I mean, for growing up, we, we learned about prison even before we even went there. Yeah. You know, that's a pretty common theme and that might, um, play into some of your, your, your research that, yeah. that we'll talk to in a second, because I, I am, uh, from a qualitative perspective, independently, without me asking, people that I've spoken to are saying a lot of the same. There's a lot of similarities in, in the, the way they thought about the prison experience um, and, the, and the lifestyle. Um, so then getting to prison, um, what was that like? And did you end up, did, did you enroll in education while you were incarcerated? Or did that come later? No, that came that came after prison. And, and, I, and I'll tell you why. I mean, I got in, years ago, Oh, my first terms, I got my high school diploma. I was, I was pushed away from education in ninth grade. Pushed away from education because, uh, I mean, we, I can tell you now based off research and based off of my understanding of school to prison pipeline, you know, I had learning disabilities that were completely undiagnosed. Probably something you hear a lot. So I was pushed away from school. I liked school. I just couldn't concentrate, you know. And um, <clears throat> when I got my high school diploma in prison, uh, a number of years ago, a long time ago, it was a packet, basically correspondence, high school. So I always had this high school diploma. I thought that was a good success. I always wanted one, got one. But uh, the term that really um, awakened me and got me to this place where I'm at right now was um, uh, my last term, 2004 to 2007. The short, short bid for a little robbery. Um, but when I was there, you know, part of an IP, which is uh, uh, American Indian, I, I, I got to stop using the word gang. I want to stop referring to prison subcultures as gangs because they're safety nets, right? But I, I'm part of an uh, American Indian group, small group. And in prison, I was active doing prison stuff checking on the brothers, checking on the elders, running politics, you know, whatever game was going on, you know, tobacco trade, the drug trade, whatever's going on, I'm doing prison stuff. And so being part of a small group, one, there wasn't time to be like real proactive in, in um, a program, like education, like vocation or whatever, right? Secondly, because I was part of such a small group, the system had their eyes on us all the time. What are they doing? You know what I mean? You know, the prison, the prison guards and the prison structure watches us. That every time I did say, hey, I'd like to maybe check out education. And they said, no, nah, you got to see, you got to write up here. You have discipline here, you have this there. Right. And they perceived me as being somebody I really wasn't. Yeah, I was protecting and taking care of what I had to take care of, but I wasn't getting into a lot of trouble. Yeah. You know what I mean? I wasn't actively fighting or doing all this stuff, you know, but they're perceived ideology behind our group or any group they're like no you don't deserve it so they the system becomes the gatekeeper as to who can actually access certain resources right education being one of them so i would say that definitely i didn't do any college while i was incarcerated at all but this is my research topic and i think this topic is super important because it's a, it's an ignored population um i wrote my master's thesis when i got my master's degree 
um, on this idea of a cell block intellectual, on this idea of cell block pedagogy. Because I, just because I didn't do college while I was in prison, doesn't mean I wasn't being educated. Right. I had, uh, and it doesn't mean that also like, because I was part of a, a Native American subculture in prison, and we have a lot of rules in California about these subcultures, right? Very racist. You don't cross certain lines. You don't do, you don't mix, right? You're talking general population yards. Rules that I can tell you right now, I didn't agree with then. I don't agree with now. But I wasn't in a position to say I don't agree with. Yeah. I had to go with the flow. You know what I mean? I'm not going to risk my life over some empathetic act in there. You know, I risk my life now for an empathetic act. I care about people. But with education, and I'm going to tell you a short story on how it really all started for me. Uh, one of my elders gave me the book, uh, The Four Agreements. Typical self-help book, Four Agreements. He said, that's a good book. You should read it. So I'm sitting in my cell one day, door open, day rooms open, yards open. Uh, and I'm just sitting there and I'm reading this book. And I put the book down and, you know, I'm just doing some other stuff in the cell. This, this black dude comes up to me and he comes up to me and he says, uh, he stands at the door because he can't come in the cell, right? Our, once again, our racial lines, our boundaries, we don't cross. But we know the rules. So he stood at the door and he says, what you reading? And I said, the four agreements. And he starts breaking down the book. He starts breaking it down. He's like, oh, that's a good book. Uh, uh so, you know, talking about how that book will serve a purpose while I'm in prison. But it's not going to have any meaning once I leave prison. Mm. Because the four agreements are really hard to uphold in prison, let alone on the outside world. Be impeccable with your word. Don't take things personal. That type of stuff, right? And um, he says, he says, here, you should read this. He brought me a book, right? And he brought me... Uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Paulo Freire. Yeah. And he's like, here, read this. And when I got the book, I read it and I didn't understand it. Yeah. And I gave it back to him after I read it. I don't know, it's probably like three weeks later because it's a hard book to read, right? But I knew then that I was thirsty for something. When I gave him back the book, oh, and then the other thing he said is don't get that book taken away from me. For me right so i gave him back the book i said I don't, I, don't, I don't get it i understand maybe some concept in there whatever and then he says read it again and then he critically started talking to me about banking models of education and he started it's probably the first time i ever heard the term school to prison pipeline and zero tolerance policies like he was not going to school either but he understood what this book meant I read through him and through a couple other of these, what I call cell block intellectuals, these, this idea of this cell block pedagogy is we stayed away from traditional education because it wasn't afforded to us. The gatekeeper was saying, no, not you. Right. But it doesn't mean that these keepers of banned books weren't educating others. And that's what my research topic is on, is bringing to light that in traditional how the United States society, how our society, um, we uphold like this idea of a, associates and bachelors and masters and PhD, but it doesn't mean that that education and, and in the formal education that the informal isn't happening. It's happening in the prison cell. It's happening on the prison yard. It's happening on the prison benches. It's happening in the barber shop. It's happening at the park. It's happening on someone's porch, right? And that because an individual isn't quote unquote, established through the Academy of Education, doesn't mean that they're not capable of teaching. I read Fanon, Marx, I read Lenin, I read these, you know, socialist and or like revolutionary thinkers. I read, uh, and these are all banned books that these individuals are willing to go to administrative segregation, and willing to get write-ups, books that they're not allowed to have. They yeah. guard with their life contraband. And um, I was blessed to have uh, 
his, he goes by the name of Squeaks, an old black man. Um, I'm blessed to have, and I always always pay homage to these men, uh, Mitch Bodner, Rodeo Joe, these men who like took time to, wasn't just about like, wasn't just about the literature, it's about the healing of a broken boy, right? Not even like the man who I am, but this boy who suffered the trauma of growing up where I grew up, born into the system I was born in, and then learning about historical trauma and colonization. Like these, I was, I was a sponge just bringing in all this information, right? And, um, and so even though I can tell you right now, I was not educated formally in prison, I was definitely educated in prison. And um, I remember the day I got out of prison, my elder said, you know what? His last message with me was, one, don't come back here. Second, go help the people. I had no idea what that meant. I understood don't come back here. Yeah. You know, and um, probably, I don't know if you've ever heard me share this story, but Squeaks always would tell me, like, these men in this prison with you are your perceived enemies. They're just like you. Right? And I remember walking the prison yard with him one day, and he's like, what do you see? And in my juvenile thinking, I'm like, just a bunch of convicts. You know, a bunch yeah. of gang members, a bunch of addicts. Right. And he broke down economics. He's like, you know what I see? I see poor people without lawyers. I see trans women and gay folks who systematically had their rights stripped of them and then their dignity by the stuff that their peers, the prison guards, the courts have done to them. He's like, I see poor working class folks who through their intersections don't have like these are the words I'm listening to in prison. Yeah. And I have no idea what the fuck is this guy talking about? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But the more I read, the more I understood that conversation that I had with them. So that was all my squeaks. But when Mitch Bonner said, man, go out and help the people, I had no idea what that meant. But I knew that it meant don't come back to prison and just be of service. I don't you know. And so um, so yeah. To answer your question, I was not formally educated in prison, but I was definitely educated in prison. You know? um, this is what's so cool about meeting you know everybody out here is that that was beautiful, and now I have to read your thesis if you'll allow it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in two thousand and two, when I was in prison, I decided that it was my calling in life to um, help people incarcerated and what I put like my mission statement was helping the impoverished and incarcerated get quality education. And when I was thinking of that, I was not necessarily thinking of formal college education. What I was thinking about was all the trash like propaganda and books that are popular that that float around mm -hmm. that pr promote racist ideologies and things like that. And I was like, if you don't have money, if you don't have family, if you don't have anybody helping you, then you just read whatever is there and you just you just absorb whatever is there. Um, and so I just wanted to be that person like my grandmother was to me who did like went on the internet, she would search stuff, she would send me books, um, just trying to help me get my education. I didn't really know where I was going. I spent a lot of time wasting my time yeah. until I kind of figured out, you know, what I needed to do. Um, and so I, that whole dynamic, it was so frustrating to me because I realized that if I want to do what I believe I'm supposed to do and, and help people in prison, I have to have these letters behind my name or people yeah. won't listen. Mm -hmm. And so I just I went through my education a lot of times with like bitterness. I'm like, you know, you don't know how much I learned and other people learn on our own in the cell, reading and talking and dialoguing. But we don't have the degrees. So it's like the yeah. nobody wants to listen. So I, I went through that whole process, but I completely I understand the potential of people who are incarcerated, their ability, the potential to learn. They just need somebody to just come alongside them and like help. Yeah. You know, here's here's some resources, run with it. Um, so I think that's great. That's yeah. beautiful. So when I talk about success, for example, I don't necessarily mean somebody who's Dr. So-and-so yeah. or a millionaire. I have a very good friend who's neither of those. But I knew him in prison and I knew him when he got out. He was a wild man. Mm -hmm. And now he's taking care of his three kids and uh, and he's a family man. Like he's posting pictures of Disney World and stuff. That's and I'm so like, awesome. yeah. 
that to me is success. Like knowing where he came from, who he was in prison, and now he's like posting pictures at Disney World. It's amazing. Yeah. So formal structures, um, you know, they only get you so far. There's a lot of, you know, whatever we want to call it, hidden talent, hidden potential, um, underground scholars. There's a lot of things going on that are not reaching, you know, or manifesting themselves uh, at a social level. But I think it's beautiful. I really appreciate that. Um, it's another thing, just meeting other people. Like a lot of the things we're thinking are similar. We just didn't have the words right. uh, or the concepts to get it out. Um, but it's been a process of learning. So now though, uh, out of prison, you are pursuing higher education. Mm -hmm. You've done a master's. And so now you're doing a doctor degree. Yeah. I'm doing a doctor degree in education. Um, you know, I've got an associate's degree in counseling. I've got a bachelor's degree in psychology a master's degree in sociology. And I think that, yeah, I think one of the reasons why I continue in education is because I, I teach at the community college level. I teach at the university level. And there's something very powerful about us, about formerly incarcerated people in the classroom. I hear from students all the time, like I've never had a professor like you, never had a professor with your experience. And then aesthetically, you know, you get, I get tattoos on my head, my face, my neck, and they're like, I've never even seen a professor like mm, you. Right. And it connects the students to the syllabus, the curriculum, it connects them to, to the class content just by all of a sudden this, this experience of ours, of mine, builds trust like that with certain populations of students. And then they can see themselves using this privilege of education in advocacy. So I think that, you know, you were talking about the importance of having those letters behind your name. That's mine too, because I don't want to, I don't want to be, I don't want to be away from education. I think it's very important that we, we change the outcome of the literature. We change the research. We change, you know, I mean, I don't know how many articles and books I've read about from people who've never even stepped into the prison, right? Let alone lived it, experienced reentry, experienced addiction and um, experienced recovery and experienced like, like the Martine that sits here in front of you is different from five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. I continue to reach like a different place. And I believe that using my education, my experience, my advocacy, the work with sitting with other formerly incarcerated and system impacted folks. I mean, it feeds my soul. You know what I mean? It feeds my soul every day. And it's like, um, it's an emotion, it's emotional labor. Right. But yeah, I think that, uh, you know, it's not just about the doctorate degree, but ultimately the connection of the doors that doctorate degree is going to open. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yep. I think uh, once again, I go back to Mitch Bodner and the words go help the people. <laughs> once again, I still don't know what that means, but I take it literally like this is going to help people. This is not only that, but it's going to help me. Right. Like I'm uh, you said earlier how. Um, I love being a father, right? I was a, I was a horrible father. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like lied to my kids, lied to let them down all the time. Um, especially my oldest daughter. And now, you know, to go through this, like years of healing between her and I, uh, her and both my daughters, that I'm trustworthy. I'm, I'm, I'm reliable. Uh, I've earned I've earned the the word dad. You know what I mean? And yeah. that that's based on like education helping me heal. Right? I'm not this like bad dude. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not. But it's like one of these things where it's like mm -hmm. that helps. You yeah. know what I mean? Education and learning and giving it all back. It has to be reciprocated. What I learned needs to be given away. Right? And so it, it's it's powerful stuff. And so um, yeah, education is just more than that doctoral degree. It's all about what it it helps me heal. It helps me understand my experience. It helps me understand the experience of the the next person, the next formerly incarcerated person who comes into my circle. I'll be like, whatever you need, we got. And if we don't got it, we're going to get it. You yep. know what I mean? Because they're important too. Yeah. I want everybody to be on this journey. And what you said earlier about 
you know, people being successful, not even just, you don't have to have education to be experienced. Your homeboy taking pictures of Disney World. That's, I love that stuff because yeah. it's about just maintaining the job, communication, love, respect. That is success for a lot of people. I love seeing that stuff. Yep. You know what I mean? Of course, I like seeing them walk across the stage with a doctorate, a master's, a bachelor's, an associate's degree, even vocational certification. The cap and gown means a lot, but also when your kids can say like, my dad's home, my mom's home, and I love them. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Come on now. I think Go one on. of the things, um, I just call it my, my calling as a, as a teacher. I just feel this overwhelming obligation to teach. Yeah. And I just find ways to do that. And my, my objective, my population, my audience is always the incarcerated, broadly impoverished because people who can't afford the education but um, still deserve to have quality education in things that matter like civics and character and how they understand. I think, um, I just call it my calling, but it sounds like you've got some something that you feel like compelled to yeah. teach and be there and, and, and help students. Um, so, I, you know, I just I think in this uh, conference, in this space, like we're cultivating others who have that similar calling and helping them um, do that better. Yeah. And I, I just think that uh, there's a lot to be said about that in the in the coming years. So you're you're working on your doctorate. Um, what kind of. Uh, what, what we call now collateral consequences. What kind of challenges have you faced because of convictions just getting along in life? That's a good question because I think that um, the more I establish myself in my area, it's less, right? I mean, uh, I don't work with cops, but cops know my work. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They know that I'm going to go into a court school with young people or continuation school with young people and I'm going to mentor them, bring them up to the university to sit in the classroom with us or sit in the office where I sit with other formerly incarcerated students and we're going to mentor these young people. We're not trying to change these young people. We're just trying to be there for them, right? So people in the community know my work. So when I apply my work um, and they say, hey, can you come visit a jail, visit, a, you know, visit the folks inside? I'm like, yeah, I'm there, right? So this has stopped me. I think that some of the, the biggest barriers I face um, with this experience is, you know, I have strikes on my record. California, everywhere, you got strikes on your record. It's really hard. It's hard to get rid of it. Most of my record has been expunged and slow process, but my goal is to get the, 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 the full pardon on my record. Um, but the university I work for where I got my master's degree, I also teach there and I run um, Project Rebound there. Um, they accepted me right away. You know, we know you got a record, it's all good, right? But yeah. I, uh, the community college um, in my area, they um, they asked me for a background check, a live scan. I gave it to them, no problem, right? And they already knew my work. They already knew who I was. But it was one of those things where... Um, you know, they they said, write down the crimes you've committed. And I was like, man, you write them all down? <laughs> I don't remember that stuff. Yeah. And I did. I wrote down the most pertinent, more important ones and or the ones I remember. And as soon as I did the live scan, they got the report back. Some stuff I even forgot about came up. And now they're like saying, oh, now you're lying to us. Right. So what are you hiding? I'm like, I don't remember 20 years ago. Why are you going back so far? Right? I mean, yeah. the strikes on there, the potential for violence or whatever you want to look at the most important ones are there and that's not a lie but you know so i think that that comes up but i think also i've been out of prison 14 years and been doing this work ever since that uh for me um hasn't really been much of a barrier because i'm also an open book you know what i mean i walk into a space and a school or university or whatever. I mean, I, I, don't, I openly talk about being formerly incarcerated. I openly talk about this experience, but I think it's also uh, coupled with this idea that I'm here to support other people, right? So um, quite honestly, I mean, I got a little apartment. I live by myself, cool little car. Nothing really ever, nothing really, there's no barriers. In the beginning though, when I, the reason that I got pushed into education 
<laughs> and I say pushed. It's, it's funny. When I got out of prison, um, it was April of 2007. Um, there wasn't a lot of resources for parole, so I went to go live with my sister. And between April and July, I went through four jobs, right? And one job, my, my homeboy hooked me up. It was doing construction, but it was for a major corporation. And they did a, you know, they said, yeah, come to work. Worked for like two weeks. And then I, the application, they saw you got to do a background check. And yep. they found out and they were like, like it's construction, man. Yep. But because it's corporation, liability, got fired. Went to a temp, a temp agency and they did like 28 day hires. And after 28 days, if the company liked you, you fill out the application and you can permanently work there. And I remember working for a, a wood company, like a skateboard company, but they asked strict. After 28 days, fill out the application. They said, I'm sorry, you got felonies that are too fresh for us, right? Best job, janitorial job. And, and all these jobs, I'm telling you, I showed up on time, willing to work extra hours, willing to brought my lunch so I didn't have to leave. I was like a, a model employee. Yep. Put that record and and that's when I that's when I knew like this is gonna be a hard this is gonna be hard for me. And that catapulted me into education. Because once again I didn't know I was gonna be doing this. But when after I lost that last job, my niece was the one who said, Hey, maybe you should try going to school. Remember, I got a high school diploma at this point that I got in prison that I don't even remember anything about. Yeah. But I was like, I ain't got no other thing to do. Let's try it. And um, if it wasn't for her literal hand-holding at the community college, I wouldn't have come to school because I was terrified of school. Yeah. I felt like a, this was back in 2007. Look at how many programs were in the state of California in 2007. There wasn't very many. Nobody was talking about formerly incarcerated or reentry in the way they're talking about it now. And, um, and, and you know, I mean, she said, go to school. Literally, I went, I went and I was like, all right, cool, I'll check it out. Terrified to be there. So, but in that, in that me being scared going to school, because I was scared, every time I went to the parole office, man, I'll tell another person, man, you should come up to school. You should check mm -hmm. it out. You should check it out. Yeah. Selfishly thinking I needed my people with me. Yeah. Right. And um, I think that spearheaded also the, the, the programs that I've started, you know, bringing formerly incarcerated folks to school, cohort models of education that now I'm teaching, right? Before I was just, a, I was a student and a recruiter and an advocate for this work. Now I'm actually doing still that stuff, but I'm also teaching the class. You know, I have class, I have two classes where I teach uh, intro to sociology and everybody in my classroom is formerly incarcerated. To oh, wow. Model. Yeah, so it's a transition. I should invite you into, we meet Tuesdays and Thursdays online if you want to log on. But, you know, I've got, my current, right now in my class, I have 24 formerly incarcerated students and they go through the program together. And it has an 85% success rate, meaning 85% do not go back to jail or prison. Yeah. And for me, um, I would have never gotten there if it wasn't for somebody saying, you know, no, I can't hire you. No, you're not employable. I'm sorry, I can't bring you on to workforce. And my niece saying, you know, go check out school. But right then, that's when my advocacy started. That's when people began to see my work. So barriers really haven't been an issue. It's been actually like um, people are attracted to it. Yeah. How can we start this program here? How can we get this over here? And I, I, don't, I definitely say I'm not an expert, but I kind of feel like I know what, I do, what I'm doing. You yeah. know what I mean? And so there hasn't been a lot of barriers um, after that, you know, 2008, 2009. It's just been strictly education and um, working working in education, whether it be through federal work study or, um, you know, nonprofit work, right? We're nonprofits. So we're not going to do a background check on you. We want you to work for us. Yeah. So um, I've been lucky in that regard, but I hear, I hear it all the time. I can't get this apartment. Can't get this, this, this resource. I can't get a job I hear it all the time. And so I think that we are, I think that we as a society need to actually Realizing like, what's forgiveness? I committed my crime, yes. I took responsibility, yes. I came home and I want to do better. When am I going to be forgiven that I don't have to report this anymore? Yeah. You know, that's the next I think that's the next big step for us as a society. As as a as a group of formerly incarcerated individuals willing to do policy work, that's the next big step. Forgiving people for what they've done. Yeah. You know? 
That's um, it's great that you brought that up because that is um, what's at the heart of it is the 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 collateral consequences the system the institutions don't take that into consideration. That's not like a legal principle, you know, forgiveness. What is that? That's like religious or virtuous. It's something that is right. not a part of the right. institution, but that is exactly what's needed, and not just for us, but just our culture generally. This whole idea of forgiving somebody for past deeds or wrongs is, is absent. Right. Uh, and it's sort of like manifesting itself in ways that are um, preventing us from being as successful or productive as, as we could be. So yeah, I've been denied like car insurance, mm-hmm. uh, homeowner's insurance, life insurance, apartments, you know, jobs. But being involved in education, um, it's not as many barriers. There are still some, but it's not as many barriers because in different ways it's often sought out or respected mm-hmm. um, for either our experience or our ideas. Um, because whatever one's theory about mass incarceration, it is just numerically a fact that an overwhelming number of people have been affected by it. Mm-hmm. And so that changes our society, not just the people who were incarcerated, but the families and the friends. Um, I actually work with a mm-hmm. warden, I, two former wardens at the community college I work with. And being able to dialogue with wardens and former officers, I realize like they have cousins or brothers or families locked up. So it's not like people in prison are foreign, strange, right. others. Right. Now, like it may have been 40 years, 50 years ago, like being involved in a prison, you're like this evil serial killer type person. But now so many people have been affected. Everybody knows what's up. They all know that just because you've been to prison. Yeah. But we still in, the, in a culture, like in our movies and our TV, still have a, a particular image Mm-hmm. a particular stereotype about people in prison. It's good that you haven't experienced those those sort of consequences. I have, but we just push through it. Yeah. We just get over it. Like we, we use our resourcefulness and creativity. Like we get around it, yeah. figure out a way to move, move past it. So you're in school as a student, but you're also teaching. That's something that I've experienced as well, teaching and also being a student. Um, and you're involved with a, a bunch of different uh, organizations and entities all trying to make a change. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about that, some of the organizations you've been a part of or even some of your research right now that you're looking forward to. Yeah, so um, currently uh, California State University, San Marcos, where I, I, I mean, it's such an honor to be a teacher, professor, a mentor, right? Um, I'm also the program coordinator for Project Rebound, which is a program for formerly incarcerated students seeking their bachelor's degree or master's degree in the CSU system. And that role right there to me is, once again, I'm honored to be able to share space with formerly incarcerated students and just seeing like their success, which their success is my success, right? But I also on the flip side, their failures, which there aren't very many, is also my failure too. Like they get a, a bad grade. Mm. I don't want to feel you get this bad grade and impact your GPA. Let's work on it. You know, let's find you a mentor. Let's find you a guy. Let's, you know, that work is like expunging their records, helping them move beyond this this stigma that's with them. Um, just being able to and en- help people enroll in school like that. Project Rebound to me, that work is. I love doing that work. Being a professor being able to teach at two community colleges, a CSU and a UC, and just kind of guide students and support students. I mean, that that work to me is so important. Um, writing research, I'm writing research, I'm doing research right now. I've got um, a few articles published and uh, I'm working on this dissertation. Um, usually I'm really good at research. Seems like lately I just don't have, I'm like, I'm lazy, I'm lazy with it. I'm tired of writing, you know, of writing right now, but, um, you know, just continually, um, you know, doing research and working, um, on that. And, you know, I mean, I think it's also important that, uh, the non-education or the non-campus work. So working, I do a lot of work in community schools and court schools, as I said earlier, but also like, transitional living homes where folks are coming home from prison, they don't want to go to school, see if we can find your job, let's see what we can do, build up your resume or give you a real tight resume. Like that work to me is like, is just as important as a college application. Folks don't want to go to school. I'm cool with that, but let's help you get a job. It's, I teach a lot of um, social and emotional intelligence skills, 
right? I think that that is so important. That's like, to me, where I'm, I feel like overpaid because I feel like once I came to terms with my trauma and I've learned about it and I can teach that to another person to help them get beyond that trauma too, that's important work too. So, and I think that that's all gonna tie into my dissertation. I'm not doing that work for my dissertation, right? I, like I said earlier, it's, a, it's an emotional labor. Um, I love what I do and um, it does. It contributes to the betterment of our society. Even if for the, the formerly incarcerated population who still has ties to the incarcerated population that they, that if I can contribute to the wellness of this community and they can contribute to the wellness of the incarcerated community, that when people know they're coming home and they have role models to look up to, right? We're, yeah. we're all doing this work together. Yeah. And so it, I think it's important that, yeah, I just show up every day, do this work, you know, do this work. And I think that, um, you know, at the community college, I run a program called the Transitions Program. Well, I don't run it, I teach it, but I work with these amazing people who run these programs. Like I said earlier, cohort model of education. We're actively recruiting students right out of jail, right out of prison, whether they've been out recently released or been out for a long time. If you're formerly incarcerated, you want to come to community college just to see what it's about. You know, finding the funding that provides them books, supplies, stipends for school, um, I mean, that's a beautiful thing. You know what I mean? So stay busy. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for taking the time out of your yeah. day to come up here and visit with me. I know you got a lot to do. You said you're going to go do some writing after this. Yeah, see that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I hope to, you know, continue to network with you, you know, be a part of different things that you're doing and moving into the future. So yeah. thanks Likewise, so much. Man. Thank you for having me. Appreciate yeah. it. No problem. All right. really.